But uh, let's go ahead and go ahead and turn your your Bibles over to Hebrews four, Hebrews four, and I, and I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I don't know. I think I like I like preaching. Period. But I think I, I sometimes enjoy Wednesday preaching, sometimes a little bit more than other. Pre- it just depends. I think the messages. It feels like there's less pressure in the middle of the week for some odd reason. Uh, it might just be perception, which you know how they say perception is reality. But if you'll turn to Hebrews four. And we're there in in verse 12 of Hebrews 4, and uh, you'll just keep your finger there. We will come back, but we're going to be jumping around uh, as I usually do. But Hebrews 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing, that, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help him in time of need. And, you know, the, the title of my message really is, is kind of just a quirky one, but I was just thinking about those old commercials. Do you remember that, that guy that used to teach, have those uh, commercials where he'd sell, and he's like, look, this thing will slice and dice and do all that. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll make your, your, your life easier. Remember they used to sell that little chopper? And uh, I was just thinking about how one of the things that you grow in in your um, in your faith when you're trying to walk in the spirit is how much more clear and precise you try to be in life. So the title of the message today, or the sermon, is slice, dice, and be precise. And, you know, because you think about just how the you know I was thinking about this verse and how it's a it's sharper than any two-edged sword, the word of God, and and it's not the only reference, and we're going to look at that about how God makes a reference to the sword and how it. It divides right here. I mean, it actually tells us it's piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So, I mean, it even makes that distinction of the soul and the spirit. It'll divide that out. And, 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 and just to put it in context, and we don't, we're, the, the sermon is not about body, soul, and spirit. But obviously, you know, if you're saved, the soul is already taken care of. But sometimes we might not be walking in the spirit. We might be backslidden, right? And the word of God will divide that out. You know, one of the things that's very clear, and, and, and that's what I'm going to cover today, is just how the Word of God is very, it'll, it will slice. It'll slice through, not just the soul and spirit, but it says there, the, the, the marrow, the joints and the marrow. And it's interesting also how God ties everything together. You know, these people that want to fight evolution, you know, we get our blood from the marrow. That's where blood production comes from, you know, when we talk about the blood. And then it says... Uh, right here, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God pierces even your thoughts and the intent of your th- of your of the of your thoughts and your heart. And we're going to be seeing that. And so I don't normally it, it's not a at least it's not my common technique of sermons. But every once in a while you just take from something else. I, I'm going to do an alliteration. And the first point that I want to make is that we have to be separate. You know, be separate. And that's really, I think, the point that this is trying to get at is that God creates that separation with his word. You know, Pastor and I were talking just earlier, just a few minutes ago before I started the sermon, about how we had a couple of church members and one of uh, the couple, the reason they stopped coming is because the husband did not like that we were King James only. You know, well, that's like the foundation of everything, because if we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Word. The Bible references that the Word of God is Jesus Christ. So that's a good thing. You know, the, this verse applies to that. It says that the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Basically, it separated us from someone who didn't want to listen to the Word of God. You know, and I actually think that's a good thing. You don't want individuals in here whose thoughts and intents of their heart are not what the Word of God is. You know what I mean? We're all in different stages, but I think the one thing that I'm trying to get across today, and this is my goal, I hope that that comes across, is that when you get saved, it's one thing. You know, and, and everybody 
understands it differently. But as you grow, if you if you intentionally and grow, because it says intense, right? That means you have an intention. If you're intentionally growing in the word, if you're intentionally walking in the spirit, then what ends up happening is you do eventually become more separate from the world. I mean, it's just a natural progression. You become uh, more disgusted with the sin of the world. You you hate things that God hates. You you don't want to partake in certain sins. And and not only that, but when you do sin, you're more aware of it, and you you come to God and confess that much quicker than when you're just saved and you're not going to church and you're not reading your Bible. You know, I mean, it doesn't really do anything. You know, you're not really uh, growing in Christ, and you're not really reaching for those rewards and stuff. So the first thing that we see here in this verse, and, the, and you know, obviously we could cover that whole chapter, but the, the thing that I wanted to focus on, because I don't know, it just really stood out to me the last couple of, of days, is the separation. And if you'll go over to number 16, but I'm going to read for you Genesis 3. We know the story in Genesis 3. This is the fall of man, Adam sins. And right at the end of Genesis 3, uh, verse 22, it says, and in the meantime, you're in number 16, but it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has is is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from, when he, from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And so we see that the sword has a significant meaning. And actually, if you just were to do a study on the word sword, I mean, it's used a lot. You know, that was the weapon of choice. Uh, I know a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, that idiot politician from El Paso say something about they're coming for your guns. And, you know, everybody in Texas was in an uprage. You know, the Bible actually speaks of having self-defense. And I mean, the equivalent of what those weapons are today would be the sword. You know, that was the, the weapon of choice at the time. But for us that are in the spirit, God gives us that spiritual weapon in his word. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to preach about the Second Amendment. If you're here, you believe in it. If you've read the Bible, you know what God, Jesus says about that. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. But I'm talking about that spiritual battle. You know, when you read in Ephesians, he gives us this whole armor. And what's one of the things that he does, we're going to cover it, is he gives us the sword of the spirit, right? Which is the word of God. And so the thing that we need to understand is that if we want to be separate, we have to focus on the word of God. See, what did, what did God do there? He gave him, he, he put up a sword to separate, but why was he separating? Because he didn't want them to, you know, eat of the tree of life that would give them, you know, that eternal, that now they know the knowledge of good and evil, and then they're going to go and just continue down that path of destruction. So he removed them because the only life that is eternal is through Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, we see that even from the beginning, that whole plan. But go to number 16. I'm just giving it now. This is just more of, for example's sake. Uh, but you look there in number, six, uh, in number 16, uh, verse 21, and this is the story of Korah and that dissension, you know, that. And, and even within the brothers and sisters in Christ, even within like-minded believers, even, even if uh, every once in a while you get with somebody and I mean they agree with you on every point. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say that most Baptists, at least let's, let's categorize them as independent Baptists, would agree with maybe the majority of what we preach. And I say that, I'm not, uh, I, I say that lightly because there's, there's certain things that they won't, but the majority of the, the main doctrines, you know, salvation by grace, the King James Bible as the word of God, uh, soul winning, things like that. They agree with the majority of that. But even within that, if they're not in the word, if they're not armed with the word of God, there can be contention, there can be dissension, there can be uh, internal battles because people get in the flesh and then they forget to esteem others better than themselves. And we see this here. Now, Korah, they weren't, obviously, we're going to see here that they were not saved that they were not brothers and sisters, but we see that God's always making the separation. And even here, there's even a, another separation of the congregation. We'll see this here. Let me not get ahead of myself. In verse 21 of number 16, we see it says, Separate yourselves from among this congregation This is uh, that I may consume them in a moment. 
And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, show one man sin, and will thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tent of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sin. So they gat up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tent, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them in my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then shall ye understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass... As he made, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation, and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And so we see here, in, in my opinion, just from what we read, we see several separations. We see, obviously, these are reprobates. You know, we've talked about that, but these are people, because, you know, sometimes people will say, well, well, I'm not going to worry about salvation because, you know, as long as, as long as I ask at the last minute, at the, my la before my last breath, you know, I can get saved. Well, I we mean, Korah and, and Dathan and Abiram, they had a chance and they didn't because they weren't, because God already had given them up. I mean, th this was more of a show of power of God showing that this was a serious thing that they had done going against a man of God. But then if you look there, what really stood out to me is you see that it says, then all, uh, And all Israel that were round about them fled and, at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. So there was others that, you know, they listened to what Moses said, but they didn't quite completely believe them you know he said remove yourselves and they were but they were close enough to the action to maybe think that they weren't that far removed you know what i mean by that is sometimes you know we might take some some actions in our life where we we're kind of towing that gray line i mean is this really considered a sin or not look if you're if you're towing that line it's probably a sin you know what you should do you should make yourself apart from them you know i'd rather be with moses in that group that was Watching from afar. You know, I, these guys ran in fear because they, they all of a sudden felt that conviction that they might be guilty. Does that mean? Now, they weren't, obviously, because they, they had the opportunity to flee. But they shouldn't have been close to, that close to the action in the first place. You know, that's why they feared. It says, And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And, you know, that's the thing that the two ages, it makes that separation. But it also, that's why the gospel message has to be so clear and concise. Look, they now knew who they were dealing with. Maybe they believed on the Lord, but they weren't walking in the Spirit. Let me tell you, watching some people get swallowed up by the earth, you're going to, that'll do something. I mean, even, think about it today. We were just here, and all of a sudden we walked out, and there was a group of guys that were trying to pick a fight with Pastor Cobb. And then all of a sudden the earth swallowed them up. I mean, we'd have some serious changes in our lives, right? But we got to believe by faith. You know, the Bible tells us to not, that we're not focused on the temporal, the things that we see, but the eternal. If you'll turn over to 2 Corinthians 6, while I'm in Luke 6, go to 2 Corinthians 6, and then we'll come, we're coming back to Hebrews. But go to 2 Corinthians 6. In Luke 6, we see another uh, form of separation. It says, and he lifted up his eyes, in verse 20, he says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger for now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast you out, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. 
Rejoice thee in the day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. And, you know, I, I did a whole sermon on rejoicing, you know, uh, to be joyful when we're reproached. Rejoiceth when you're reproached. And, and I actually, you know, was leaping because, you know, it's funny how people will go to a basketball game or a football game and they'll jump up and down for joy. But the Bible tells us here, blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you. And cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. You know, we're getting there. And as a matter of fact, we're not getting there. We are there. We're just there in pockets. It's my belief that we're already there. It just hasn't, the virus hasn't infected the entire world. You know, it's like when you, you know, uh, we were talking about cancer. Well, cancer sometimes can start somewhere, but it hasn't infected the entire body. But what is a cancer? What it's going to do? It's eventually the goal of cancer is to invade the whole body and destroy all the cells, right? Well, that this is the cancer that we're dealing with, the people that hate the Word of God. And what is, this, what is the Bible telling us? Look, His Word is so strong, is that two-edged sword will separate down to the soul and the spirit that people are going to hate us. It says, and they're going to reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Look, I mean... You've heard me say it before. I'm not going to go through the names. You've heard me mention the names, but there's there's a ton of uh, preachers. It's happened to me. I, I don't post as much on social media, so it's not like a regular occurrence for me. I've I've experienced it maybe once or twice. But there's people that have experienced it all the time, where you put something on about the Bible. You know, you you quote Leviticus 20:13, or you 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 make a mention about the Sodomites, and they take down your post. They censor your word. In that same feed. I've had to sit there and sometimes hide a post because some filthy pervert will put, post up a picture of some semi-naked someone. You know, we live in a world where it's okay to talk about the filth and destruction of the world, but when we get up behind the pulpit, I mean, the news media will come out. The only reason we don't have the news media come out is because we don't, you know, I'm not that good at the social media and YouTube. I mean, I preach all the stuff from here, and, you know, it's all over, and Pastor Cobbs preached hard on on all kinds of sin. But if the media were to get a hold of it, they'd be pounding on our, on our door because we're so evil. You know, and they'd say things like, that small church, they're so backwards, they'd probably compare us to some radical terrorist group. I mean, are you kidding me? You know, I saw, I saw something where, and it, it actually really stood out to me that these are the things that really made me think about this sermon. I saw this little, I guess it was like a newspaper picture, and it had two guys sitting on a bench. It was in, like a cartoon. You know, one of those political cartoons. And one guy sitting there uh, talking, and he's reading about, I guess, the, the school shootings and the spotlights on him. And then the other guy is reading about all the sex trafficking and all the wars and Epstein and all that, and he's in the dark. You know, the, the media's going to put the spotlight on what they want. The, the devil's going to put the spotlight on what he wants. And the spotlight really is on those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you think about it, what, what negative, evil thing is it that we preach from the pulpit? We don't. It's not negative or evil to say that certain sins are punishable by death, including the sin of sodomy. It's not negative or evil to say, look, you should walk in the Spirit. You should flee fornication. You know what? You should love your brothers in Christ. You should have fellowship with those that believe like you. I mean, it's not evil to say, look, women should act like women and men should act like men. But the world says it's evil. I mean, they're, they're getting to the point where they hate us. Go to 2 Corinthians 6, and we're there in verse 14. The Bible says there, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You know, I mean, basically anybody who doesn't believe is likened to an infidel because that's the contrast right there, right? We're seeing all these contrasts. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Look, 
We talk a lot about soul winning. We talk a lot about salvation. But that's for going out to, to reach the world. You know, but the purpose of the church, the purpose of Pastor Cobb, the purpose of myself is to help you grow in the rest of the Bible. And this is a clear message to those that believe, look, you can't just be on the sidelines. God wants you to be separate. He's, he's like, you're either black or white. Because when you see darkness and light, it's either one or the other, right? He says, I want you to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship? And then he gives us that contrast, right? That's a, that's a stark, there is no gray in, in, this, in these verses. Turn back to Hebrews 7, Hebrews 7 and verse 24. It says, but this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. We're in verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. You know, like the point of being separate is not because you're you're out of the, you're not going to be saved. The point of being separate is because you love God and that's His commandment. I mean, honestly, it get, it's that simple. If if you love God and He's your heavenly Father, then obey. I mean, yeah, we can talk about all the rewards. We're going to get crowns in heaven. We can be competitive, but when it comes down to it, He gave us the free gift of life. That's His commandment. This is His word. That's how we're going to fight these battles. This is how we're going to use this sword, how we're going to wield it. You know, it's not good. We were just talking about how some of us, you know, should probably go get our, our permit to carry our weapons in church. Just to, you know, always be, be, we've had shootings here in the past. We had a small Baptist church in, in San Antonio get attacked. But what purpose, what good would it be for me to carry a gun if I don't know how to use it? You know, what's the purpose of carrying your King James Bible and telling everybody how great the King James is if you don't know how to use the King James. You know, what's the purpose of saying that you should have good fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ when every time they take your pew, you don't have good fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, we have to be separate from the world, but we, we must have fellowship with ourselves, right? The second point I want to make is that we got to be in the Spirit. So we got to be separate, and then we have to be in the Spirit. If you go back to Hebrews 4, verse 12, we see that it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Well, that word quick is, is uh, you know, to bring alive. And we're going to see this. And uh, let me just finish this for the sake of, of uh, completion. It says, and, and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. You know, that word quick in the Bible means to, to make alive. And the the biggest reference that you see is the quickening spirit. You know, the fact that when we, that when we accept Jesus Christ, think about how, how great of a wonder it is to come to the realization that you were walking dead before Christ, that you were breathing. I mean, that didn't even make sense to the world, right? But for us, it does. You're walking around and you're breathing, your heart's pumping, and it's a dead body and a dead spirit. But then you're made alive and the flesh now is dead. But the Spirit has been made alive forever. I mean, that's, that's a great, pretty powerful, supernatural thought. You know, I don't need any of these uh, Marvel and DC comics to tell me how great God is. You know, as a matter of fact, I think it's kind of dumb, the stuff that they do. But that's a, let me not get off on a rabbit trail. But if you guys will turn to John 6, I'm going to read for you 1 Peter 4. Go to John 6. 1 Peter 4 verse 1 says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. See, God requires us to arm ourselves. And if you're going to arm yourselves, then you got to know how to wield it. And I'm talking about this two-edged sword, right? The Word of God. He says, what is it likewise with the same mind? God requires us to have the same mind as Christ. Now you say, well, that, you know, because I've heard that argument. People say, well, you know, I've, I've told people, look, Jesus left us an example of how we should live. Yeah, but I'm not Jesus. Well, I'm not saying you're Jesus. I mean, come on. 
Thank you for pointing out the obvious, Captain Obvious. I'm not saying you're Jesus, but if God said in his word that we can do these things, then we should do them. And not only that, we should believe that we can do them. Think about, you know, you don't need motivational speakers. You don't need the Joel Osteens of the world. God is about the most positive being there is. I mean, think about it. He never even worries. He's, he wrote a whole book and gave you the ending. And the ending is victorious before it ever happened. I mean, none of us could write that, that book. I mean, people could say that, you know, they're going to play sports and they're going to win. You know, you've heard people say uh, in the past, oh, this year we're going to win the pennant or we're going to win the World Series or we're going to win the championship. And then they have to eat their words because they didn't do that. Nobody in history can, can predict the future except for God, right? But we see here, it says, for, for as much then, let's go back, and let me just finish reading this. It says, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So what, what is it, the mind that he, he's saying, look, get out of your own head and take on the mind of Christ. It says, for the time past of your life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Look, you want the world to think that you're not running with them. We don't run with them. I had a lawyer today. You know, we were talking to a lawyer for the consulting I do. And uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before he was talking. And, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to use... And, you know, whenever somebody says, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to use it, usually they're, they're letting you know they're going to use some, some profane language. And so then he used the language, and then uh, after he piped up and everything, I said, you know, uh, um, I said, it's okay, everything you told us, that's a great strategy. I said, but I just want to let you know, I don't usually listen to profane language, so I'm a little offended. You know, I made a joke, but I, would, I did tell him, you know, what's interesting is, the guy likes me on the phone. I mean, we've never met in person. We've just dealt with him through stuff. And then today we were talking with him again. And then I made some joke about, you know, him not charging us a lot of money. I said, make sure you don't charge the doctor a lot of money or whatever. And he's like, man, you never, you are relentless. You never give up on the fact you're always negotiating. And he says, that's why, you know, at least uh, I get a little solace in the fact that I, I, I make you cringe a little when I use my bad words. You know, it's all in jest. And I don't take offense because the Bible, first of all, tells me not to get offended. But it's interesting because the other guy is on the phone and he's not picking up. I'm not, it, it, it's going to happen when you're for Christ, right? People are going to point at you. He thinks it's weird that I think that it's normal not to want to listen to bad words. He thinks it's weird. So now he's picking on me. It is what it is. I'm not here to, I mean, it's, honestly, it doesn't offend me. He can do whatever he wants. I mean, what I really need to do is lead him to the Lord. But that's how the world looks at you. They think you're kind of like this backward individual because you don't do the things that, that they do or you don't want to partake in the sins of their, their life. You know, and that's what this, this is telling us right here. Uh, go, you're there in John 6 and go to verse 60 and you've heard Pastor Cobb and me use this a lot. But this is Jesus preaches this sermon and he's talking about this is my flesh and this is my blood. And you, you get to verse 60 and it says, many, therefore, of his disciples, here's that separation. I mean, it says his disciples, these are people that are following him. When they had heard this said, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? So these are people who, who agreed with Jesus to an extent. You know, why is the church not packed out more? It's not because there, there's not people here in church that don't believe like we do. They just don't like to hear some of the hard things that we're saying. It says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, doth this offend you? You know, what did Jesus do? He offended them with the truth. He says, verse 62, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up, ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are the Spirit. And they are life. You know, basically, what is, this, what is this separation? What is this sword of the Spirit that he's talking about? He's saying, look, these individuals have been offended because they're looking at their flesh. 
I, I basically, you know, pushed a couple of buttons. My sermon bothered some people because it bothered some of their sin. You know, we should never, and, and if you are, you should, you should work on it. You should never be offended when the pastor gets up and preaches something that, touch, that touches a nerve. Because that's, unfortunately, he's going to, at some point, if a pastor preaches the entire counsel of God, he's going to touch somebody's nerve. Because I don't care how good of a life you live, you know what? We're all sinners, saved by grace, right? So there's some sin in your life that the pastor's going to preach about that you're going to be like, wow, is he preaching it right at me? How does he know? You know, you ever run into those people in the car? Man, the pastor was preaching right at me. How did he even find out about that stuff? You know, the pastor's just like, I was just reading my Bible. But that's it. Why do people get offended? Because it says they're looking for the prophet in the flesh. And what did, what did Jesus say? The flesh profited nothing. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are the spirit and they are life. And then we're going to go to the final point. And because I did an alliter alliteration, you know, it's be in the spirit, you know, uh, be, be separate and be specific. I know I, I, the sermon says slice, dice, and be precise, but that's because it rhymes. But in order for my alliteration to work, I had to find a thesaurus and get a synonym that was uh, specific, which is the same thing as precise. But it, it's good to cover as many words as possible because you also heard me say we need to be clear with our presentation. Look, I think back to all those times where I gave the gospel as a babe in Christ, and Maybe they didn't take as good as, as I, I, I know. I know now that my presentation is so much better that the people that I lead to Christ, my percentage is higher that those, actually, that those people that say they believed, they believed. You know, there's no guarantee. I, I don't think I hit 100%. I, I, would be, uh, I would be lying to myself and others if I said, every time that someone says the sinner's prayer with me, they believe. You know, because there's Judases out there. There's people like Judas that will go out there and they'll go soul win with you and they'll preach the right words and they'll say all the right things and they're just false prophets. But I just think how, how sad, you know, and I can't beat up myself. The Bible says not to focus on the past, but it just said, it's a good reminder to continue growing in the message, to continue growing in Christ, that I gave the gospel 10 years ago and I don't know if it was as clear and as specific and as concise that it split, that it made, that it, that it clicked. And, and the reason that I think that is because there's people that say, oh, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm like, okay, well then, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Yeah. Was well, there anything that you can do to lose your salvation? Absolutely. If I, if I commit adultery, well, then you, you're not saved. And you think about it, all those people think that they're going around Leading, leading great lives, and they're like, oh, when I die, I'm going to heaven. And I don't, you know, that's a serious responsibility in us that those people might wake up in, in hell. It's for forever. I mean, this is an admonishment to us to be very specific. We should know what we're talking about. You know what? The Bible actually speaks about, if you don't know what you're talking about, it's better to keep your mouth shut. You know, I mean, it really is, right? And, and sometimes the ego gets in the, in the way, like, it, like, uh, like Jesus said here, the flesh gets in the way and it profits for nothing. You know, to me, it's a serious thing. I, I'm all for the battles, all the, the topics that I touch all day long. But at the end of the day, the battle that those are all part of, of the plan for the ultimate goal, which is to lead people to Christ and have them grow in Christ. It's not just enough to lead them to Christ, because think about, look how many people we've led to Christ in the last few years that aren't here today. Think about all the people that Brother Bobby's brought. They accepted Jesus. We baptized them. They're gung-ho, and they're not here anymore. Thank God that they're not going to hell. But, hey, there's no specificity. So then they go around saying things that are erroneous, and instead of being a, uh, a prophet, they're a stumbling block. They're a detriment to the gospel. And I'm not mad at them, but I think that they should be here because, or they should just keep silent. Because, you know, you see, and I've seen some of those, these guys, they put posts on Facebook about how they just believe in God, but they're not very specific. Well, look, Joe Olstein says he believes in God. That doesn't mean people are going to heaven. you got to get specific. You know, that's why we use the King James. That's why we say it's on Jesus Christ. That's why it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
But let's go to the final point. I've only got three references here. Uh, go to Romans 8. I'm going to be in Matthew 10 real quick. Matthew 10, verse 34 says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. You know, we have to be specific. He says, I came not to send peace, but a sword. See, Jesus came. He, he didn't come to give us peace. He came to bring a sword. Why? Well, if you go back to Hebrews 4.12, it's for the, the division, for the separation. He says, for I am, I am not come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother. I mean, he says, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be, they, the, shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth it, his life for my sake shall find it. You know, for many, many years, I always accepted this. I have always, and I've always been kind of in your face about this, like that we need to, you know, that we also have those verses where it says, you, you know, you hate your mother. And, you, and I've always, it's never been an issue for me, but I never completely understood it. But the more, that's why the Bible is so great about being specific. It's at, the way that I look at it now is not that you don't love your family, but as you grow in Christ and you love Christ more, they're just going to not love you as much. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? Because when you start saying things like, well, if you, if, if queer uncle one and queer uncle two show up to the family gatherings, well, we're not coming. Guess what? Everybody's going to get offended, especially in a Hispanic home because it, you know, that's the bad thing about all these movies and TV shows. Everybody says it's not specific to Hispanics. I mean, just get around any Italians. They'll tell you the same thing or Irish or whatever. Name the nationality. Family's most important. Well, that's not what God said. He said, look, you've got to love me more. And people say, well, that sounds contradictory. Actually, it's not. Because when you love God with all your heart and your might and your soul, well, guess what? It's a natural thing to love your family up to the point of death. Because you understand what God has placed in front of you as a responsibility. Here he's saying, look, there's going to be variance. So if Jesus didn't come to bring peace but a sword, what do you think our duty should be? Should it be to bring peace? No, the Bible tells us to live peaceably amongst all men if possible. But it's for our duty to preach the word. And guess what? It's going to cause some division. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's happening every day, it happens every hour, and it gets worse and worse all the time. Go to Romans, uh, you know what, actually, go to Revelation 19, that's where I'm going to close. I'll just read real quick for you. You know, Romans 8, 31, and you've heard me use these verses, but it, it, it's just so great that you can come back and get something new out of it. But Romans 8, 31 says, what shall we say then, uh, what then, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that com condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall and I love that. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, Christ requires us to be separate, but he's inclusive to his children. See, I'd rather be separate from the world and be part of the family of Christ. Because then Christ comes in and he says, look, I'm not big brother and I'm not, I am Christ. You know, I remember I was never, a, I was never the big older brother that came to the rescue. My, if you ever meet my brother, my brother's like 5'11", you know, he's like 250 pounds. I mean, he's a big guy. And he's not just tall and, and big for Hispanic. He's a big guy like, you know, my, my, uh, my grandma had a saying for him. I don't know if you remember the boxer from the 80s, Manitos, Manitas de Fierro Duran. He was a real famous boxer. And that translation is that he had iron fists. And my grandma coined that term for my brother because his hands were so, he was so clumsy growing up that everything he touched, he would break. Like, he's a big guy. So, you know, my brother was the type, it was always the opposite, right? If someone was picking on me, it was big baby brother to come into the rescue. But here, God's saying, look, nobody's going to separate you from me. He's not the big brother. He is Christ Almighty. He says, 
He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persu persuaded that neither in death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So even though Jesus came not to bring peace but a sword, all he's doing is just separating out the sheep from the goats. Go to Revelation 19. I'll read for you real quick Ephesians 6. I'm not going to read the full, whole armor of God, but we know that's the chapter. But verse 17 of the armor of God says, and take the helmet of salvation, and what is it? And the sword of the Spirit, and then it defines it for us. It says, which is the Word of God. See, it's important to know what is the sword that we're yielding, uh, that we're, uh, yeah, that we're uh, wielding, not yielding, that we're wielding. Go to Revelation 19, and we'll close out with this. Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, I'll give you a second to get there. And it says there in Revelation 19, verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So we see... They, uh, right there in verse 13, it says, And his name is called the word of God. And then it tells us that a sharp sword comes out of his mouth. I mean, th this is, this is going to be something to witness. I mean, when Jesus comes, I mean, he came and he was not anything to, to talk about. He was not anything to brag about, the Bible tells us. You know, and, and he, he was dynamic in the sense that he was healing the world and he was causing division. But he wasn't anything to brag about. He wasn't like like uh, the angel of light. But here, I mean, he's coming, and he's got, he's ready, he's ready to, to roll on these wicked, perverse individuals, right? It says, he came through, he's faithful and true, and, the, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. I mean, Jesus is not coming. He's not going to sing Kumbaya. And then it says, his eyes were as a flame of fire. Think about that. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And then we see he's, he's dipped in a vesture of blood. We see that his name is called the Word of God. And then the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine, white, uh, fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. So think about it. Jesus coming down, and he's on fire. And he's got this vesture. And then he opens his mouth. And what comes out? A sword. And says that with it he should smite the nations. And then all of a sudden he just starts taking everybody out. And I mean, I'm not, I'm painting a picture here. And I'm not, uh, the purpose wasn't to be gruesome. But it is gruesome for those that didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I would much rather be on the separate side. And if you read all of Revelation, you know that this is after what? After that the devil's released. And what is what is he? He's released for a season. And what is the devil's job? What is his only purpose? Is to kill the saints. So it's not like in the flesh we're going to have it good all the time. As a matter of fact, it's not going to be like that. But the thing that we should be encouraged about is that if we are going to be part of this, this movement, and by the way, I've used other times that you know there's a, this thing called the New IV movement, but I'm talking about this movement of going out there and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, this movement of growing in Christ, we have to know what our weapons are and how to use them. And there's nothing more important than the word of God and that two-edged sword that divides. It divides that soul and spirit. 
and the bone, the joints and the marrow, you know, and the intents of the thoughts of the heart. You know, it, it's in God's instructing us, and you saw. I mean, I I showed you how He says we need to be separate. And I could have just spent hours on being separate. Just go to the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Genesis. I mean, the whole first five chapters is it's all about separation. You know, and then about you know being in the spirit. I mean, just go to the New Testament and just walking in the spirit. And then about being specific. I mean, there's not a more specific book of prophecy than the Bible. I mean, just get to. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm still you know I was going through Chronicles and I, I was telling somebody. Remember in Chronicles, I mean it's specific that lineage, right? He's going through the tribes and he's giving you the name after name after name. Then you see in Matthew the prophecy and you see the lineage. And then you see a lot of specifics in here. We have to be ready. You know, if you think about a surgeon, you know, we we're talking about how Brother James might be going to surgery in a couple weeks. He wants a good surgeon that knows how to wield that scalpel, right? And that scalpel is going to divide clean. You know, if you take a, a, a knife that has, isn't sharp, it might as well just be a blunt object, right? You're just going to beat that thing and chop it up. It's not going to do any good. And then sometimes my wife didn't, she tried to get me the name of the, the, the surgery tool, but, but uh, she forgot. But it's a, it's a scalpel that has heat so that when you cut, it's an even cleaner cut because as you're cutting, it's cauterizing so that there's no blood. So as you cut the skin, it's such a nice, clean incision that there's no blood so that the surgeon can actually work and do whatever he wants. Well, think about that with the Bible. I mean, it's a fiery sword. It's a two-edged sword. It's not just one edge. It's two edges, and it can do a lot of damage. But it can also do a lot of good, right? And that's what we want. And I actually, you know, I, I say this a lot in business. People don't like uh, sometimes the way that I do my consulting because I'm very direct. And I just want to get to the point. And usually when you're, when you're like that, people's emotions flare up. And the reality of who they are comes out. And they're like, why do you do that? I'm like, well, when it comes to business, you want to do things quickly. You know, you want to, you, you, you've been hired to affect the change and they want, they want it quickly, right? If somebody says, I want to make more money or improve my business so I don't have to like go poor, it has to be done in a time period that's fast. Well, you can't lollygag around with individuals. Look, if somebody's going to blow up and get angry, they, if they blew up and got angry with me in five minutes, it's probably better that they did it in five minutes because guess what? A year from now, some point in the future, they were going to do that exact same thing. Their personalities are going to come out. Well, that's the same thing with the Bible. Look, I want to preach the Word of God so that if somebody hates God, I want to know that they hate Him now. I don't want to waste my time. I want to go and, and preach the gospel to those that are receptive, the ones that want to listen. And I want to teach and, and help others learn the Bible to those that want to teach. I didn't even know. I mean, pastor told me and he didn't know what I was preaching. That guy left because we were in King James. Good. I don't want to waste my time with someone who doesn't want to listen to the word of God. I'm not being a jerk. It's just I'd rather be here with you guys. And I know that at least you're listening. We're going to grow together. And if it's just one person or 100 people, if they're, they're serious about it, then we're going to be precise. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to preach tonight. Thank you for a message. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that it's a two-edged sword that, that helps us to divide and uh, encourages, Lord, to be part of that division so that we may be separate from the world, but we may be including your family. I mean, we're already saved by grace, but how much sweeter I think it's great to just, I mean, I don't want to be the least in the kingdom. I, I want to have some of that reward or maybe uh, have a city to look over regardless, we're in heaven, but it's sweeter also here on earth. Even through the trials and the tribulations, the more specific, the more uh, precise we get on your word, the, the easier it is to deal with the trials of everyday life. So thank you, for Lord, for just teaching us to be uh, separate, to be walking in the Spirit, and to be specific with the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.